please remain standing. Please remain standing for just a second as we read the word of God. Come on. That's why you came to church today was the word of God. You didn't come from some bald preacher from the middle of nowhere where you don't even know where Idaho is on the state. Come on. We came here for the presence of the Lord. We came to hear from him. And so I'm excited to be able to preach today. It's an honor every time I get to come to Freedom Church. I very much cut my pastoral teeth right here in this room and uh, under the leadership of, of Pastor Sean and Pastor Connie, and I'm so grateful to them. Come on, when you, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to be in a relationship with somebody when you get along all the time, when you've been through some stuff, though. That's a good, that's a friend, right? When you've been through some stuff. When you can sit in a hot tub as a grown man with another grown man for eight hours in Montana and talk about life and ministry and theology all in the same breath. Come on, you know that's a good friend. Pastor Sean is that good friend. Come on, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. I'm trying to help y'all out. You need to lose your minds. Come on. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Sean, Pastor Connie. Let's get to it. Let's get to work. Push up your sleeves. If you got a Bible, go to John chapter 1. I'll read you this quick verse. I'll let you sit down. John chapter 1. When is he going to let us sit down? In a minute, man. Chill, okay? John chapter 1. Verse 1 starts off this way. In the beginning was the Word. Notice that the word Word is capitalized. That's weird, right? Because he's not talking about a word. He's talking about a person. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's pray one more time and ask God to speak to us in a supernatural way. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We come here for you. God, we come, we tune our ears to your voice. We need to hear from the word today. So Holy Spirit, come, move in the way that only you can. We pray that you would bring life to your word. We pray that you would electrify this text, that it would fire off between the conductors of our hearts and our minds. Will we not just be doers of the word, but will we be not just hearers of the word, but will we be doers of the word? So God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, so that we may grow closer to you so that we may worship you, for there's no one like you, Jesus. We worship you in this place. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Come on, in Jesus' name, everybody said. Come on, if you love Jesus, give him one more shout of praise up in this place. Come on. Yeah. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, worship team. I am am so glad to be here. I bring uh, greetings from the land of Boise, Idaho, and the good people of Create Church. I'm here with my wife, Brandy, who's actually sitting in the new seating area. This is amazing. Hey, back row. Hey, back row. Wave to me, guys. Hey, guys. Yeah. Must be binoculars back there. The nosebleeds up there. And uh, Brandy and Brody, my son, are sitting up there. And then we've, and we've got our daughter, Amelia, who's sitting up here. And then we also brought two Idahoans to town, y'all. Yeah, um, Stephanie and Chris Condon are here, good friends from Idaho. They, they've been on our team since the beginning. Stephanie was our first hire. We just hired somebody. Yeah, y'all pray for her. She works for me. I mean, how, like, can you imagine? It's, it's, she puts up with a lot, and uh, she does all of our admin. She leads our missions team. Her husband, Chris, does production and video. And they're expecting Eli James, their first child, in two months. Come on. <laughs> Grow in the church one kid at a time. We call our kids' ministry Create Kids. You'll get it later. All right. I I, I was praying about, God, what would you have me to bring today? You know, I knew I was doing this for a while. Pastor Sean asked me to do this quite a few months ago, and I was praying, like, what would you have me to share? And and I was really thinking about about it. This last year, um, I'll be honest with you, I've been nerding out about a particular person in the Bible. Um, We got any nerds in the house? Can I just see some honesty? We got any nerds? I'm a nerd, y'all. Like, if I, I'm one of these guys that's kind of obsessive. Like, if I find out about, if I get into something, like, I've got to understand the whole thing. Like, if I get into an author, I've got to read everything they've ever made. You know, if I, if I get into a, a movie director, I've got to see everything. And, and, like, I'm that guy that will get into, like, just the, 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 the time warp of reading Wikipedia all night because of its faithfulness to truth, right? You know? <laughs> Said nobody any, everywhere. Um, but anyway, I'm just, I'm that kind of person. And I started off this year doing a book study at Create Church 
um, on the book of John. And now we're kind of going into a series of Revel, uh, uh, in the book of Revelation, which was given to John. And I mean, I've just been nerding out about this guy, John. And the, tr- and the thing is, I, I, when I get to heaven, other than, you know, after meeting Jesus, I'm, I can't wait to meet Jesus. I, I mean, I just, that's what it's all about, right? But after that's over, 10,000 years, you know, after I've been just worshiping at his feet and I'm never going to stop, I can't wait to meet the Apostle John. You know, like, I'm sure Paul's going to be great. I'm sure Peter's going to be great. I, I'm sure that Moses will be interesting and Abraham and Elisha and Elijah and all those guys. But the person I really am excited to meet is the Apostle John. And John is somebody that, that I really relate to. One is because I just love his courage. Like he's just, he's just a man of integrity, right? He's just a guy that's just there through thick and thin. I mean, he's the only disciple, the only disciple out of the 12 that actually showed up for the crucifixion. That's saying something, isn't it? Like out of all 12 of them, he's the only one that showed up. And to me, I just love that, right? I just love that integrity that even though he could have been like, you know, guilty by association and thrown up there too. He still showed up. He's the guy that ends up taking care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, after Jesus ascends into heaven. He's just, man, he's just, he's, he's, a, he's a dude of integrity, and I love that. And yeah, he's arrogant, right? He was so sure he was Jesus' favorite. And, 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 and he definitely, him and his brother went up to Jesus and asked him for special seats in heaven, you know, that whole thing. He's definitely got some arrogance, but I, but I love that about him. But I think, the, I think the thing that I love most about the disciple, the apostle John, is his creativity. A lot of times we read the Bible and we think it was written by a bunch of ignorant Palestinian hillbillies with a broken crayon on the back of a piece of papyrus, right? And like that they're just like, um, and then Jesus went, you know, like, like that's our concept of biblical writers. And that's just not accurate. I mean, the people that God chose to pen the Bible were incredibly intentional, incredibly good at what they do. And John is, man, he's just, there's no one who writes like John. I mean, all the gospels are good. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all good. You know, if you want to go to Matthew, you get, like, some of the Jewish background, which is really cool. If you read Luke, it's really cool because he's a doctor, right? So he's, he's all about the details and all about the logistics. And, and so he's, like, very detailed. And then you can read the, the book of Mark, which is like a Michael Bay film. Like, it's all just action scenes, right? It's all the highlights of Jesus' life. That's why it's so short. Uh, but, but, the, but the gospel of John, man, it's just, it's amazing. It, it's different. It's it's, it's got this creativity, it's got this detail, it's like an onion, you continue to pull back the layers. I mean, it's just absolutely brilliant. And instead of just opening up his book with like, hey, so this is how Jesus was born. No, he starts it off in this creative, artsy way, right? He's like, hey, in the beginning was the word. And we're all like, what? Like, and he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Not only that, but the Word was God. And everything that was made was made through Him and by Him. In fact, nothing has ever been made that was never not made. I mean, He was there in the beginning. John starts off his letter wanting us to know that even though Jesus is a 33-year-old man, He existed before that. This isn't just some dude. This isn't just some guru. This isn't just some self-help guy. This isn't just some guy that's going to like have a podcast and help you find self-actualization. No, 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 no. This guy is divine. He's fully God and fully man. And in the beginning, he was the word and he was with God and he existed with God. God. It's, it's, he's, playing, he's, he's paying homage to the book of Genesis, right? You've read your Bible before. You remember the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. It starts off, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It sounds a lot like that, right? And, and, and then he says, you know, when the earth was, was formless and it was void and darkness hovered over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was there hovering over the waters and God did what? He said... Let there be light. We serve a God who speaks creation. Like he he is a a star-breathing, planet-speaking creator God. And what John wants us to know is, man, this guy Jesus, he was there. He was there. It was by his word. It was by him that it was created. Colossians 1.18, Paul writes it this way. He says, in him everything was made. 
everything was made. In him, in Christ, everything was made, whether thrones or, or, or dominions or, or rulers or authorities, all things were created in him and for him. And again, they just want us to kind of get this idea that he was in the beginning. He wasn't just born 33 years ago in a manger. No, no, no. He's the pre-existent God that created all things. And so... What I want to do is I was praying and asking God, what would he have me to teach on? What I felt like he said to me is, just get up there and share your favorite John story. And so what I'd like to do with your permission today is I'd like to just nerd out a little and, and just tell you about my favorite John story. Can we just do a Bible study today? Can we open up the Word and just pull out some truths? Y'all ready for that? Okay, so here's what I want you to do. If you've got a Bible, I want you to open it up to John chapter 5. And I'm hoping that through this story, through this amazing John story, you're going to see maybe a Jesus that you've never seen before. Or maybe you'll just be reminded of the God, the word that you and I worship. That Jesus isn't just some great dude that we put on a t-shirt and call our homeboy. Right? Because that, sometimes we can, like, we can put Jesus, we can force him down into a box. And today I just want to blow up that box. I want to explode it and so we can see him for who he truly is. Right? So John chapter 5, when you're ready for the word, say preach it white boy. Verse 2, chapter 5, says this. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. Now again, a lot of us, we open up our Bible. You know what I mean? We've got our colored pens, our best more Bible study, our coffee, pumpkin spice latte, all this kind of stuff. we got our phones so we can take a picture so there's proof because... No pics, it didn't happen, right? So like, you know, like we're all ready to read it and we get to these details and we're just like, we just skip over them. But that, that's such a shame because there are so many details that John lays out for us that are so important. Can, can I show you a couple of these details real quick? Thank you for your permission. It says now there in Jerusalem, so this story is happening in the city of Jerusalem. And if you don't know, Jerusalem, old Jerusalem city was kind of shaped like this. He says in Jerusalem near the sheep gate. How many of y'all know what the Sheep Gate is? Probably not many of us. So, so let me just show you. If this is, the, oh, this is an overhead view of the city of Jerusalem, um, there, around this city was a huge wall. This is a fortified city where the wall still remains. You can actually go and visit Jerusalem now and see the remains of the old wall. And in some places, these walls were hundreds of feet high. And so how do you get in a city that's completely surrounded by a wall? You guessed it. Gates, right? <laughs> Circle gets the square. And in the old city, there were these gates. And Paul says, hey, where this story happened was, was right here, near the sheep gate. And near the sheep gate is a pool. And archaeologists have actually discovered the remains of this pool about 100 years ago. And it's right next to the sheep gate. And he said this pool next to the sheep gate, it was called... Bethesda. And Bethesda is Aramaic, which is an old language, and it's really the combination of two words. The first word, Beth, means house. And the second word, Esda, means mercy. And so what you and I as English-speaking Americans need to know contextually is, is that this pool, it was known as the house of mercy. And the reason that the sheep gate was called the sheep gate was because all the farmers who lived out here in the valley, they would bring their sheep. Man, they don't make chalk like they used to, huh? They would bring their sheep, their herds of sheep, close to the city, and they would bring them into the city so that they could be sacrificed at the temple, which was right here. The sheep gate led right into the temple. Because in the law of Moses, you had to take an animal and you had to sacrifice it for the atonement of your sins. And so these farmers would herd their sheep and bring them in directly into the temple. But, but you can't just take a dirty old sheep and make it a sacrifice. You have to prepare it. You have to cleanse it. You have to get it ready. So what they would do is they built a pool so that they could give it a bath. So they could take the sheep, dunk it, early image of baptism to cleanse it, to purify it, so that it could be ready to be the atonement for people's sin. 
Now, here's where it gets really, really cool. You ready for this? There's another gate I want you to know about. It's this one right here. This gate is called the golden gate or sometimes called the beautiful gate. And anytime Jesus would enter the city of Jerusalem, he always went in through the golden gate. In fact, there's an Old Testament prophecy before Jesus was born that said the Messiah would come through the golden gate, which is why it's called the beautiful gate. In fact, right outside of the golden gate was a garden that Jesus really loved to hang out in with mountains. This was called the Mountain of Olives. This was the Garden of Gethsemane, and here Jesus would pray. And again, on Palm Sunday, Jesus would be riding a donkey into the city, straight in through the Golden Gate, right into the temple to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy. But later that week, when Jesus would be arrested on a Thursday night, when Passover started, he was arrested right here in the garden, and an, and an, an arrest that happened during the night was illegal. So they didn't want to bring attention to themselves. They couldn't bring him right into the Right to the golden gate, that'd be silly. So what they did was they snuck him in through the sheep gate because he's the lamb of God. Do you see how all this connects? So all of this is significant, but I'm not done, I'm not done. <laughs> so during the Crusades, a thousand years ago, they actually took over, the, the, the Islamic people, the Muslim people took over this city and they actually boarded up the Golden Gate. If you were to go to Jerusalem right now, the Golden Gate is completely sealed up. Why? Because they knew the prophecy, so they sealed it up so no false messiahs would ever walk through it again. Not only that, but they don't call the Sheep Gate the Sheep Gate anymore. You know what they call it now? The Lion's Gate. Why? Because one night, one of the sultans, the king, he had a dream, a nightmare, where he was standing in front of the Sheep Gate. And he saw a ferocious lion. And the lion was about to devour him, about to rip him apart limb to limb. And he said, I'll let you live if you take care of my city until I come back. Now, that may just be some random Muslim dream. But I just sometimes wonder if the former lamb of God, who is now the lion of Judah, showed up to this guy and said, you better take care of my city until I come back. All of this connects in this beautiful way. But back to Bethesda. So again, John opens his letter. He says, hey, right there by the sheep gate, there is a pool called Bethesda, and it's got five covered colonnades, which are basically like porches with pillars. And that's where our story takes place. So now when I read it, it's going to be like reading it in 4K. Check this out, okay? Now that you've got understanding, listen to this. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these colonnades lay a multitude of invalids, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, if you've got a physical Bible, look down at your Bible and look for verse 4. It's not there. Unless you're holding a King James Bible, there is no verse 4 in John chapter 5. You need to take your Bible back and get your money back because you got ripped off. <laughs> Why is it not there? We'll see verse, verse 4, I'm sorry. Verse 4 gives us some actual context to why the invalids would lay at this pool. Because they called it house of mercy and because God had shown so much mercy through the, the sheep cleansing here, this legend started to develop among the Jewish people. Again, a legend, not biblical fact, legend. And verse 4 actually gives us context to why they would actually do this. Look at verse 4 in the King James Version of the Bible. It says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. So this legend developed that because of all the mercy God had shown in this pool, this pool now had special Jewish juju. <laughs> and, and, and throughout the day, they would see these bubbles start popping up. And the legend was is that if you were sick, you could wait outside the pool, and the first person to get in after the bubble started would be healed. And so imagine this scene. You see this colonnade, and it's next to the sheep gate. And, and, and John wants us to know the setting of what's about to go down and it's right here, you see a multitude. There could be hundreds, thousands of people 
in terrible situations. Blind, lame, paralyzed people all laying there. Can you imagine the, 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 the moaning? Can you imagine the noise? Can you imagine the smell? Can you imagine just the, the feeling of dread in the area? So again, this is the setting for which this story takes place. Look at verse five. One man who was there, who had been an invalid for 38 years. This guy right here, we're gonna call him Bethesda Bob. The Bible doesn't give us a name, but we need a name. And so Bethesda Bob, he's laying there, and the Bible makes sure that we know that he has been there as an invalid for 38 years. And something you might not know is that the average life expectancy for a man in the first century was 35 years old. I'm 35, so I would be a senior citizen, and I wish I got that discount now. <laughs> but again, the reason that, that this is made known to us is because when Jesus walks up to the pool of Bethesda and he sees all the invalids, remember, he doesn't heal all of them. He goes to this guy. He goes to this guy because he's seen that he's there and he knows how long he's been there. And basically what the Bible wants us to know is because he had been sick for 38 years, that was more than a lifetime. We don't know if Bob got sick when he was born or if he got sick when he was 10, but what we need to know is, is that he has been sick for all of his known life. The reason the Bible brings this up is because it wants you to know this is an impossible situation. Because the more you're sick, the longer you're unwell, the more discouraged you become about ever getting better. Isn't that true? You're sick for a day, you're like, yeah, I'll be fine tomorrow. You're sick for like three days, you got the 48-hour flu, you're like, oh, man, discouraged, but I'll be fine, I'll live. You get COVID and you're sick for like nine weeks, right? And you're like, oh, my gosh, am I, is this it? Is this it? Right? You're sick for a year, you're sick for two years, you're sick for five years, and you all of a sudden start to give up hope that you could ever be better. That's not true just with physical ailments, it's true with spiritual ones too. You've been a porn, a, a porn addict for 10 years, you start to feel like I could never be free of this. Because the longer you're enslaved, the more and more discouraged you be that you would ever be set free. And this guy is significant, why? Because his situation is impossible. God loves to find the impossible situations to show off. Come on, is anybody grateful that we serve a God of the impossible? That he looks for the most unlikely situation. So that's why this is significant. Again, Bob's been there 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been lying there for a long time, he said to him, look at this. Do you want to be healed? Come on, Jesus. You don't walk into a hospital and say, anybody not feeling well, right? You don't, you don't go up to somebody, you don't go up to a place where people can't walk, they're literally paralyzed and say, hey, buddy, let me fix that for you. How insensitive, Jesus, for you to ask this guy, do you want to get healed? Of course he wants to get healed. He's laying by the pool of Bethesda, not because he's trying to work on his tan, because he thinks that this could fix him. Jesus, why would you ask him, do you want to get healed? Well, but here's the thing. Here's a question that, man, I came all the way from Boise to ask all of you today. Do you want to get well? You say, well, Cody, I'm not sick. What I asked you is, do you want to get well? Because here's the thing. There was a, there's a difference between a magic trick and a miracle. What Bob wanted was a magic trick. What Bob wanted was his particular situation to be changed. Jesus didn't ask him if he wanted to walk again. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? A couple years ago, before we moved to Boise, we bought a, uh, we bought a farmhouse out in Bunna. We got any Bunna people in here? We got any good, good citizens of Bunna? I tell people in Boise all the time, they say, where'd you move from? I say, Bunna. They say, where? Bunna. Where? where? Charleston, right? You don't know. <laughs> anyway, out in the woods, out in the boondocks, past, right? You know, out in Bono, right? We bought this HUD home. And if you don't know what a HUD home is, it's a government foreclosure. And it was a really good deal. But the, the catch was is that in order for us to get the loan we needed, it needed to, the house needed to be fixed up to a certain condition for us to live in it. 
And, and I actually, you know, you may not know this about me, I actually love doing handiwork. Like, I love building things. I love fixing things. I love home improvement type stuff. Don't let skinny jeans fool you, man. I got a tool belt, and I look great in it. <laughs> and so I was like, I'll fix it. And they were like, no, no, no. You need, a, you need a licensed contractor to come in and get this ready in order for you to get the thing. I said, contractor, schmontractor, man. I got this. <laughs> and they said, contractor or no deal. Fine. And it was in that moment that I realized there is a stark difference between a Pinterester and a contractor. Can I explain this for a moment? <laughs> a Pinterester cares about the outward appearance. The Pinterester wants it to look cute. A Pinteraster wants it to look awesome. They, they care about style. They care about appearance. And we have a whole list of adjectives in which we Pinterest to get, right? We want it to look, we want it to look um, farmhouse, right? We want it to look minimalistic. We want it to look, we want it to look um, you know, uh, uh, mid-century modern. We want it to look bohemian, right? We, want, we have all these terms that we like to use. But see, a contractor is not a Pinterester. A contractor cares about the physical exterior of the situation, but they care also about what's unseen underneath. What they care about is making sure that it's structurally in intact. So what they do is they pull off the fascia, they pull off the thing that we see, and they make sure that everything else that we don't see is solid. They know that styles change. They know in 10 years, Bohemian is going to be nasty and so old, right? They know that in 50 years, if you don't fix your house, it's going to be sagging, and then you're going to pay tens of thousands of dollars to get it fixed. They also care about the outward appearance, but they need to fix what's behind the scenes first. When Jesus walks up to Bob at the pool of Bethesda, and he says, do you want to get well? He wasn't just looking at Paul's external circumstances. He was looking deeper into the heart issue that Bob ultimately needed healing from. And so when I ask you today, do you want to get well? I'm not just talking about your physical pain. I'm not just talking about your dreams that just haven't come to fruition. I'm not just talking about the things, man, that you've been praying for and praying for and praying for. I'm asking you about your soul. Do you want to get well? Because a lot of times we can read these stories and we think it's about the miracle. The miracle is a sign to something bigger. And even though you may not be paralyzed in here today, even though you may not have a cancer diagnosis today, even though you may not have, you know, anything really wrong in your life today, you have a heart issue that only Jesus can fix. And he comes before you today and says, do you want to get well? And so right there, Jesus asked him that, verse 7, the sick man, Bob, answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another one steps down before me. He says, it's crazy. I, 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 you know, he starts to give excuses to why he's not well yet. He doesn't even answer Jesus' question. He's still not getting it. He still thinks it's about him walking. But Jesus is there for such a much bigger purpose than just his ability to walk. Jesus is there for eternity's sake. Paul, Bob is thinking about his life. And so he gives an excuse of why he can't walk yet. Verse 8. And Jesus said to him, look at this, man, this is so good. Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And in that moment, at once, not 15 late, minutes later for the Advil to kick in, no, no, no. In that moment, he was healed. And he took up his bed, and he walked. Now, remember the verse I read at the beginning, and the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we're dealing with a person who's not just, not just again, a miracle worker, not just a, a magician performing tricks. He's not just a prophet. He's just not a cool-looking guy. No, no, no. This is God incarnate, the very God that has the ability in his word to create and regenerate. And so right here in this moment, as Jesus is looking at Bethesda Bob, who's laying there helpless, he says, do you want to be healed Bob doesn't answer the question, and Jesus speaks a word of healing over him. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And that moment, he gets up and walks. I actually pulled out my Greek New Testament and looked at the exact phrase that 
John wrote down that Jesus said, and this is it right here. These, this is, these are the words that Jesus literally spoke to Bob. It says, Iero, Ario, Ton Cravaton, Suke Peripateo. You impressed? <laughs> Weird flex, I know. Iero, Ario, Ton Cravaton, Suke Peripateo. And I thought, man, this is just like a magical phrase. Like this, is, this is incredible. This is the very phrase that the word of God, the word in the beginning, speaks over this body that doesn't work. And instantly in that moment, it starts to work. And Bob gets up. And we see this power that he has. Look at this. Now, that day was the Sabbath. Now, if you haven't listened to anything I've said so far, and I'm boring you, and you're like, <laughs> Mr. Chalkboard, Fancy Pants, Bald Man, whatever. Like, okay, you've been forgiven. You need to tune in right now because this story, is. this is where the plot thickens. This is where it becomes really important. All of this was to get your attention because Jesus wants to actually say something bigger. Okay, so it says here, now the day that this happened was the Sabbath. If you know anything about Jesus, if you've read, ever read your Bible, you know that the day of the Sabbath, Saturday, was a constant day of contention between Jesus and and the Jewish leaders. A lot of us have this flowery, blonde hair, blue eye, Americanized view of Jesus that he would never hurt a fly, that he's got like a, a, a mosquito on his wrist and he goes. <laughs> that is not the Jesus of the Bible. See, Jesus not only doesn't avoid contention, sometimes he purposely gets into it. He constantly does things on the Sabbath just to be offensive, not for offensive sake, but to tell them the truth. There's like this line of political correctness, this line of what's appropriate. And if you read the Gospels, and if you, I mean, if you just take a look at it, what you see Jesus doing is, oh, oh, did that step on your toes? I'm so sorry. Be healed, right? I mean, the savage Jesus here is what we're dealing with. And this situation happens on the Sabbath, verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, bro. That's not in the Bible. <laughs> it is the Sabbath. And it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. See, the, the Pharisees, they had, they, they had these laws. Not only did they have the laws, but then they added on top of it, and they added on top of it, and they created all this legalism. We would know nothing about that, right? <laughs> anyway, so, so anyway... Man, I'm not asking for trouble. But anyway, the Pharisees, they had these laws where you couldn't do any work on the Sabbath. And so they see Bethesda Bob walking, carrying a mat. You know, and he's probably walking like Conor McGregor, right, through the temple. Can you imagine a guy who's never walked in 38 years walking for the first time? I mean, he's probably like so obnoxious about it. And the Pharisees see him and they say, whoa, dude, slow your roll. It's the Sabbath. What are you doing? And he picks up here. Bethesda Bob responds to them in verse 11. But he answered them, the man who healed me, the man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is this man who said that to you? Who does he think he is? Nobody has the right to do that. Nobody has the authority to change the law. Who is this person who told you to take up your bed and walk? Verse 13. Now the man who had been healed, did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Now notice for just a second, Jesus' posture and situation. Bethesda Bob doesn't even know Jesus' name. Notice that Jesus didn't have a camera crew at the miracle. Notice he didn't take a photo op selfie. Notice that he didn't go around just constantly talking about, look, 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 look. I get really leery when people start bringing the attention to themselves and the signs and wonders that happen in their presence. I get real weirded out when people are the ones that tell me that they're the ones that prayed and then something happened. Like, really, bro, did you really need to let us know that? I mean, you remember the part where Jesus says, hey, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing? Like that humility thing. Look at Jesus' posture in this situation. Jesus heals the guy, boom, and then walks off. That's the posture 
of the God. If there was anybody who was worthy of bragging, it was the word who always existed, but he doesn't do that. He sneaks off into obscurity. Bob doesn't know his name. Verse 14, afterward, later that day, Jesus found him, Bob, in the temple and said to him, look, Bob, see, you are well. That's awesome. But then look what he says. Now sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. We see this with Jesus all the time. He's grace and truth. He always brings grace, then truth. He never brings grace without truth at the end. He never brings truth without grace in the beginning. So here's, here's the thing you need to hear. Yes, there's grace for you, and it's okay to not be okay, but we love you too much to let you stay that way. Jesus says, hey, listen, listen, listen. Now stop sinning. Stop poisoning yourself so that something worse may not happen to you. That's the truth. Repentance needs to be a byproduct of the very thing that God does in our lives. There needs to be a rotation to our life when we're walking and turning around. He says, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Verse 15, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. What a tattletale. Verse 16, and this was why, this very reason why was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. That's why they were so offended is because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath. But notice it says this is why they were persecuting him. Again, underline that word because it's about to get different. It's about to change. This is why they were persecuting him. But Jesus responds to them in their persecution. My father is working until now and I am working this was why the Jews were now seeking all the more to not persecute him anymore, but kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This is where Jesus makes a death wish. This is where Jesus crosses the line. And notice that Jesus doesn't say, oh, no, 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 you guys misunderstood me. I'm, I'm just a dude. No, 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 you guys misunderstand. I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm just a you know, peacemaker. I'm just, a, I'm just a guru, right? No, 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 you misunderstand me. No, no, no. He says, you got it right. My father's always working, and I am too. And you think, well, man, that's a kind of an overreaction, isn't it? All he said was, my father's working, and so am I. Why all of a sudden do they want to kill him? First of all is, is that nobody called God father before Jesus. Nobody. That was relationally inappropriate for you to refer to the God of the universe as your father. That was weird. And Jesus comes along and he starts teaching us things like, hey, when you pray, pray our father who art in heaven. And while the Jews believed that God, the God of the universe, was the father of the nation, to call him your individual father was just weird. How many of y'all have ever heard somebody pray to God calling him daddy. You know that feeling that you got there? And if that's you, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to hate on you. That's cool. You call him daddy. He is your daddy. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, 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 but you know, like that first time you heard that, you were like, oh, that's weird. I remember a guy that used to serve on our worship team. And, and literally every time we would come out here at Freedom, at freedom to, to, to Worship, he'd say, let's talk to daddy, y'all. And I'd be like, ugh, that, is that, that's weird, right? Ugh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's right. But it was, that's how the Jews would have felt when Jesus is calling him Father. So first of all, that was weird. But second of all, notice what they say here. It wasn't just that he called God Father, but by him saying that, he was making himself equal with God. And he says, my father is always working, and so am I. He said, what he's saying here is, I know you guys have this Sabbath, and that was me and my dad's gift to you, See, when we created the world at the beginning, um, we worked for six days and then we rested, not because we were tired, because we don't get tired because we're God, um, but we sat back and we relaxed and we basked in our glory. And so we decided to bless people and give them a day off to remember that. But then the fall of man happened in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. And since that day, my father has been working and so have I, for what purpose? To restore us back to Eden. So he's saying, don't come up to me and start chewing me out because I did a miracle on the Sabbath. You know, my, my wife, Brandy, she deals with this problem with our kids. 
How many of y'all got kids that like you're just like you're praying for that they need Jesus, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like we baptized our kids a couple years ago, but they still like they need Jesus, right? We're still trying to get the Egypt out of our kids. And uh, and so they have these moments of 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 um, you know, uh, just demon-like behavior, to be quite honest. I mean, come on, seriously, you haven't parented if you don't, if you've never had the thought of, I really think there's a demon in my child, you don't know anything about parenting. Can I get an amen from the mamas? Struggle is real. Rebuke you, Satan, right? And so my kids have this problem with their mother because we'll put them to bed at night and they'll say, well, why do you get to stay up? And here's the thing y'all need to know about my wife, okay? She's beautiful, she's lovely, she's so kind she will cut you. You don't, you don't mess with Brandy Burbage. I'm telling you, those eyes alone will shame you into a corner where you're like, am I allowed to come out? Like, I mean, she's that, she's that, she, she's one of them strong Southern women. You just don't mess with mama, right? And my kids in their little pea-sized brains as children, they don't understand that while we've set a standard for them, that standard doesn't necessarily apply to us. Because while they are resting, because they are little and they need more sleep, we're still working. What my kids don't realize is when they go to bed at night, their mama is up preparing lunch for the next day. What they don't understand is, is that mama's getting ready, getting clothes ready for the next day. What they don't realize is, is that Brandy is working to get the house ready for all the other stuff so that they can destroy it tomorrow. She's still working. What they don't realize is, is that Brandy is polishing and loading her 9 millimeter just in case somebody wants to come in and mess with her babies. Don't talk about guns at church, Cody. Right? Anyway. So, I mean, like, what they don't understand is, is that she is always working. And here's the thing. Some of us have this misguided theology. We think that God is just like sitting on his throne, sitting back in his, in his white pajamas eating Cheetos. I'll allow it. That's our view of a cosmic God. That's not theologically correct. What Jesus says here is, is that my father has been working until now, and I and working with him. And so here's, here's what we see Jesus making sure that everybody knows from this whole story is number one is, is that he is equal to God. He says, no, 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 you don't get it. I'm not here just as a man. What gives me the authority is in the beginning, I was the word and I was with God and I am God. And when I speak and I tell someone to get up, it doesn't matter if it's on the Sabbath or if it's on a Tuesday or if it's on a Wednesday. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. It's a command. I told you to get up. So he says, I'm, I'm equal to God. But again, Jesus isn't done there. He wants to push it a little bit more off the edge. He wants to aggravate just a little bit more. Verse 24. I'm sorry. Back up. Verse 19. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you. The son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him. So that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one but has given all judgment to the son. Let me ask you a question. Who's the highest authority in a courtroom? The judge. Gives judgment to the son that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Here's the big part. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Jesus here gets really, really offensive with his second big point where he says, listen, he's the only way. Woo, Jesus. You know, the whole book of John is laid out in seven signs where Jesus does these seven miracles, and John's purpose is to show you what Jesus is trying to say about himself. And the first sign, um, you remember the first miracle Jesus did where he made wine at a wedding? Come on, isn't that a good God we serve? The first miracle he did was not an exorcism or a healing, it was to keep a party going. Come on. <laughs> Love Jesus, man. Ain't no party like a Jesus party because a Jesus party don't stop. So that first miracle, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Make water, make wine out of water. That's, that's, 
That's pretty neat. Second miracle Jesus does is, is that he heals an official son who is like 20 miles away. In a pre-broadband, pre-Wi-Fi, in, in a pre-cyber you know, connection, Jesus heals a son from the downtown three-point wrench, right? <laughs> Not even in the same zip code, and Jesus heals the son. Again, really, really cool miracle. The third sign is the pool of Bethesda. And you know, I think that Oprah probably would have had Jesus on the show for the water and the wine thing. That's pretty cool, right? Probably would have had him on the show for the healing long distance thing. Maybe even Ellen would have had him on the show for that. But here? I don't know that they would have him on the show anymore. Because it's, it's extremely offensive to the world that you and I live in to tell people that Jesus is the only way to God. I mean, gee, Jesus, you can't say that. They're, they're going to cancel you, Jesus. They're, they're going to boycott you. They're going to take your Twitter away. Jesus, you can't say that. That's offensive. What about... What about the Jewish people who don't believe your God, huh? What about them? They don't, they don't get to go to heaven. They don't get to know God. What about the Muslim people, Jesus? You're telling them because they were born into that religion? They, geez, that's racist, Jesus. You, you can't say that. You're the only way. And again, Jesus isn't done yet. He's about to step on every last toe that's in this little situation here. And he continues with his last point. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you are already on the other side of judgment. Therefore, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Come on, can I get a hallelujah out of somebody in this church? 25, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is here now when the dead will hear the voice. Hear what? They'll hear the voice. They'll hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And he has granted him, given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this. Don't be impressed by this. For an hour is coming when all who are in their tombs, all who are in the graveyard, all who are in the mausoleum, all who sit in an urn up on the mantle, truth is, is that every single one of us in this room will have to face death one day. Aren't you glad you came to church? I'm closer today than I was yesterday. All of us. We will one day all face death. But the hope is in this next sentence that those who are in the tomb will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, you and I will have a physical resurrection. Jesus was the prototype that went first. All of us will follow suit either to life or to death. Jesus here says that he, because he's the word, has resurrection power. How? By what means? By his word. his word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. 
And the word was God. And it's by that word that he healed Bob of 38 years with one sentence by his word. This is what he said. And as I was studying for this message, I was geeking out, I was nerding out. I just became painfully aware that I sometimes lose sight of how great, how amazing this Jesus is. Sometimes we become complacent with the things that are familiar to us. And as I'm sitting there, I'm just praying like, God, as I'm reading this story, I'm like, God, please just show me your glory. God, reveal yourself to me. Come on, just show yourself to me. I'm, I'm there and I'm weeping like a grown man sitting in my rocking chair. Just like, God, please show me more. Show me more. God, show me yourself. And I'm one of these people that don't, I don't get a lot of revelations. I don't hear a lot of voices. It kind of frustrates me. It's like, God, why don't you talk to me like you talk to some other people? But I'm telling you, in this situation, it happened. Like, like God showed me, I didn't hear him, but God showed me something in this moment that brought me to my knees. I'm praying, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Show me the power that you have in your word. Because here, what, 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 what Jesus tells Bethesda Bob is pick up your mat and walk. It's not about just the physical healing of his legs. No, it's also about the resurrection healing of his soul. Pick up your mat, get out of your grave, and walk. So I'm looking at the verse. I'm looking at this phrase. Viero, ario. Ton graviton, suke peripateo. My God, show me your glory, show me your glory. It's an amazing phrase that God not only wants to speak over Bob, but he wants to speak over all of us. And all of a sudden, like right in this moment, something jumped off the page at me. I just started kind of counting. You know, that's, that's seven, that's 11. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. Now, maybe that's just a coincidence, but is it possible that the word of God came down, found this man who was sick, of 38 years and healed him with 38 divine letters of his mouth, of his word. For in his mouth is the power of life and death. The God that is in this is so capable, so able of healing the most broken heart. And I'm here today to ask you, do you want to get well? Because those 10,000 Instagram followers, they're not going to make you better. That may be your pool of Bethesda, but I'm telling you, it's not going to make you feel better. Because when you have 10, 15 sounds real good. You think $3 million would make you feel secure. I'm telling you right now from millionaires that I know, when you have 5 million, 10, man, makes you feel a lot more comfortable. That is salt water that you and I are drinking that will never heal us. It will never us. It's merely a magic trick. No, what you and I need is something deeper than just the facade of what we see. We need a healing for our soul. And the good news is, is that Jesus comes, the word, he put on flesh and he lived on this life. He lived 33 perfect years. And he took on our sin so that we could take his righteousness. He died for you. So there's two people in this room. One is, is that you have truly surrendered your life to Jesus. And when I say surrendered your life, I mean he's not just your, you know, you're not just a fan. He's not just your hero. No, no, he's your Savior and Lord. We live in a world right now where everybody wants Jesus as Savior, but they don't want him as Lord. They want him to get him out of hell. But they don't want him to sit on the throne of their life. Surrendering to Jesus is where you make him boss. You give him the keys to the car. He is your master. He is who you obey. And for those of us who have fully, truly done that today, I just want to remind you of the God that we serve. And that even though all of us will face difficulty and trouble and even death, we can walk tall knowing that the word of God is with us. 
And he will call our voice and we will step out of that grave. We will pick up our mat and we will walk. For those of you who haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, I'm begging you to do it today. I'm begging you, man. Because everything else that you're trying to fulfill yourself with, whether it's popularity or a relationship, you think that if you had a spouse, you'd feel better about yourself. I'm telling you, while a spouse is great, they won't. You're thinking that if you could just have children, man, that would just, that would just fulfill you. I'm telling you, it won't. You're telling me that if your dreams just came true, if you could just self-actualize, if you could just defeat this giant in your life, that it would change everything. It, it, it won't. Jesus is the only well that satisfies. And those who drink from him will never be thirsty again. So, I want you to stand to your feet, all of this auditorium from the front to the back. I believe we're in the presence of the Lord. Every eye closed, every head bowed. I want to give every single person an opportunity in here today to surrender their life to Jesus, not only as Savior, but as Lord. This isn't religion. It's not a prayer that saves you. I just want to lead you in the first conversation of that relationship. Right where you're at, if you're feeling that nugging on that nudging on your heart, you can just simply say to him, help me. You can cry out to him and say, Jesus, I know I'm broken. I know I need to be made well. Yes, I want to be made well. Speak into my heart. Speak to these dry bones that they may have life. Make me a new creation. Help me to repent and turn and walk away from the things that have poisoned me. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to ask you to be bold for just a moment. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, here's what I want you to do. I want you to raise your hand right where you're at. We're not going to call you out. We're not going to embarrass you. We have a Bible for you and some information on your next step. So right there, raise your hand if you made that prayer today. Come on, I see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hold your hand up high so the ushers can see you. Come on, Freedom Church. Make some noise for those who just made the best decision of their lives. Come on. And as we close today, want us to be aware of his presence, that there truly is nobody like our God. There's no other name under heaven like the name of Jesus. How great is he? Come on, I just want to draw your affections to Jesus. I just want to turn your attention to him in this moment and just say, how great is he? There's nobody like him. So come on, right where you're at, lift your voice and sing, how great, come on, sing it out, is our God, is our God. And sing with me how great. Come on, turn your affections to it. Come on, lift your voice to it. Come on, he's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. How great.